figure I'll go ahead and get kicking. Oh good, Adam's here, you can heckle me. Sweet. All right. So, uh, state of the project Keystone. Just, just update you on what we've done over the last six months. I've got a little bit of uh, overview of what Keystone is for those of you who are new to OpenStack, just coming here for the first time. And we've got a little bit of detail of the history of how it's gotten to where we're going and what we're going to be talking about in the future. Um, first, a little intro about me. Um, my name is Joe Heck. Um, live in Seattle, born and raised in the Midwest. Um, I kind of fell into the Keystone project because I was annoyed it wasn't being done right, and somebody said, put up or shut up. Um, so I got involved. Um, since then, I've been uh, working with the Keystone Project for the last uh, probably year, uh, PTL for the last nine months, um, and just you know moving it forward, keeping it really stable um, with just a standard pattern of making this thing as boring and simple and absolutely obvious as possible so that everything else can be built on it. Um, I don't want it to be fancy. I don't want it to be you know, glorious and anything like that. Glorious usually means something's blown up or there's this terrible security alert and the hair's on fire. It's just really not a good scene. So um, that's what we're doing with Keystone. So outline of what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, first, why Keystone, where it came from, the kind of the, the origins of OpenStack, uh, what it is, how it's working a little bit, the basic concepts and a high level architecture. Then a little bit of the history lesson that I spoke of earlier um, and then our upcoming plans and, and what we're kind of thinking about right now to move forward. Why Keystone? In a lot of respects, this was the very first of the OpenStack Commons. So when Nova and Swift came together as, as you know, the Rackspace and NASA initiatives and they started working together, right off the, right off the bat you know, in, the, in the Austin and Bear releases, you had separate IDs and you had to make separate accounts to work between them and they're like, duh, it's obvious, can't we just use the same account system? Um, but what really highlighted it was uh, kind of Glance at the time, because Glance wanted to make images available out of Swift for Nova, very obvious. Um, but to do that, you started running into, well, identity and problems along those lines, what are we going to do? So it was resolved that we should do something with, uh, with uh, making a common identity mechanism, framework for authentication uh, and basic authorization, and then start moving that forward. Um, so it started off as this common set of internal APIs expressing relevant identity for the projects that make up OpenStack. Um, and kind of out of that, it also sort of became a little bit of a service catalog, not as a primary means, but because some of the uh, URI structures for the REST APIs for specifically Swift had identity built into those URIs. So, you know, for Joe, if you want to go to my container, you have to know what my ID is. Um, and so putting it into the service catalog made that very easy to expose that out along with the relevant other identity information uh, across other OpenStack projects different button. At least I don't have a clicker. You guys see Chris's presentation this morning, the clicker thing? It was awesome. Um, so uh, what is Keystone? It's a single source of, of authentication and authorization. Um, it's the same account and credentials for starting a virtual machine instances as it is to access the Glance containers, make a Nova, uh, you know, or I guess it's Cinder volume backup now, snapshots, put it into object storage, get it back out. All of that requires identity being passed around, some sort of trust mechanism going around between the whole thing. That's what Keystone's providing. Keystone's also expanded beyond just authentication to provide a little bit of authorization. It's worth to note, though, that the pattern that we've set up within OpenStack is Keystone does not answer the question of, are you allowed to do this? It simply is the single source of truth, and the actual uh, enforcement of policy related to authorization is distributed in the services themselves. Um, and some of that code is in OpenStack Common, and we're starting to push more and more of it to OpenStack Common as it's just sort of this base common framework. And so actually the Keystone project works very actively in both the OpenStack Common area and the Keystone project itself, which is what's providing this interface to the identity systems. Uh, it's also a common means of expressing API endpoints. As I mentioned, the service catalog earlier, um, you know, hey, where can I get to to go to Nova? Where can I get to go to Cinder? Um, does Swift e exist in this deployment? If so, where is it? Um, same for any other project along the lines. Uh, Keystone is internally kind of broken up into four large functional areas. Identity, policy, token, and catalog. Now the basic mechanism by which we're doing all the authorization today is a token-based mechanism. Um, and so that's where the token comes in. The token is just something that we pass around that has a bunch of metadata associated with it that represents an identity. And so Keystone is intended to be the thing that you can query, you know, I have a token, tell me about the identity of this person and get a lot more information about them. So you can get the projects they're involved with, the roles that they have, um, anything along those lines. 
uh, then that sort of fits over into policy, and it hasn't been really explicit in releases up until the stuff coming up now, but with the V3 API that I'll talk about a little bit in the future, we're making Keystone also the central source of truth for the policy that all the services can then have a single source of being able to get it from, being able to pull it in and then enforce it themselves. So we also have a, a single representation of that as opposed to it being splattered across all the projects, different documented el elsewhere, uh, make it a little bit easier for deployers and, and everything else just to consolidate this and keep it together. And then that final part is catalog, which just represents that service catalog of what's available. Um, and you know, we just try to keep it steady and, and obvious so that we can have some capabilities there to be able to have one URL where you can go to, you can authorize, and then from that you will know where everything else in your environment happens to exist. For the basic concepts of identity, um, there's, there's three key things right now. There's gonna be some new pieces coming up in this next release of the authentication API. The first is the concept of a tenant or project. Horrible naming, I know, I'm very sorry. I didn't pick it, I had to sort of inherit that. But it's the basic unit of ownership. Um, and what we intended, or what was intended when this thing was put together, was that that level of ownership wasn't necessarily locked to a single user. So if Adam and I were going to share an account, we could have our different user credentials and be able to use this one thing that had this shared whatever, um, and that thing is called a, a project and dashboard or a tenant in some of the APIs as you see them today. Um, the user is the actual individual. It's also what we've set up as a service um, just because of some of the deficiencies of the original V2 API. It didn't quite go all the way to being able to answer questions in a solid and consistent fashion about, okay, well, who can reset Adam's password? Who can reset mine uh, when we're sharing this tenant or when we're not, um, and so forth along those lines. The new thing that's coming up that uh, is gonna help resolve some of this was contributed by our friends at HP. Uh, it was called Domains, um, and they put it in as originally as an extension for the V2 APIs, but it just kind of didn't really make sense there because everybody else had to really respect it. It would have been a cascade of changes through everything, so we went ahead and rolled it into just a new V3 API that's coming up. Um, and so domains will be added to this list at the, uh, hopefully on the next set of the slides when I do it in six months or so. Um, and then the final bit is role, which is simply that named relationship, which is always between a user and a project or a user and in the future, a domain. So you can have uh, sort of a domain role where you can reset the password that answers the question of you know, how do you set this up and so forth, uh, as well as having roles on objects um, or roles on projects that you can then transfer and use elsewise. Um, I think that covers the basics. Policy is, right now, uh, it says in Essex, obviously I didn't quite edit all the slides properly. Um, it's the same as it was in Essex, in Folsom, as it turns out. Um, it's just this internal concept right now that uh, is what became the code that was, went into OpenStack Common, uh, and a bunch of great uh, updates got made to it, God, in the past week, I think, uh, to sort of rewrite it to make the format a lot easier to understand. Uh, and that's the, the common policy file that we'll be using across all the projects to enforce uh, you know, whatever you get back with user IDs, projects, roles, and so forth. So you can say, are you allowed to do this or are you not allowed to do this? Um, it's a simple rule-based mechanism. Um, Nova Glance and Keystone were all using it as a Folsom. Uh, I believe actually Quantum had also fully integrated it in the Folsom release. Uh, and I think Cinder is in the process or may have already finished it up. Didn't quite pay attention to where it all was in those cases uh, towards the end of this release cycle. The token is just an arbitrary string um, that you know, represents a simple thing. And at, at the most basic, uh, it's a fairly, at the moment, short string. Um, in the future, a much larger string um, that you just put in an HTTP header and you pass it around with your requests. The client asks for it, whether the client is a CLI client or the dashboard doing it for you. It takes care of managing that for you. Um, and then that's what gets passed around to the various services. The services then can then look up your identity information based on that token that's going on. The reason that I mentioned that the uh, token is going to become a little bit longer string is because in this latest release, one of the things that we did was enable tokens to be PKI signed entities. And so that string went from just a simple you know, UUID thing to an entire signed uh, PKI token that we can then extract a lot more information. We can put additional information on. Uh, it really sets the stage to make some really nice advancements in the future to make this whole thing move forward. Um, and catalog. Uh, we struggled with this back and forth, actually, in this last API run. There's the idea of services, and then each service can have multiple endpoints. In many uh, simple deployments, you only have one endpoint per service. Uh, but in some of the more complex deployments, like Rackspace, HP, and so forth, you might have quite a number of endpoints for a single uh, service. And so there's two different concepts in there. They basically end up giving you a bunch of URL sets. 
Uh, and then there's a common pattern that's sort of a convention more than actual policy right now of internal and external uh, API endpoints so that you can have something that just your internal services use to be able to talk to those endpoints that's not necessarily exposed to a customer network or exposed to your customers and then your customers can have a public URL that's the one that they would be expected to use to be able to access whatever. Um, and I mentioned the token, it was this string and it had a lot of other stuff associated with it. So I went ahead and just pasted a copy in here so you can get a sense of what this thing is actually under the covers. When you actually take get a token and you just go to the keystone and ask for the service, this is the data that gives you back. It says, okay, here's the valid token and here's all the information associated with it. Uh, and this is a little scrubbed up. I removed a bunch of endpoints in there just to collapse it down a little bit. But you get the sense of it. And really the key is just that token ID and that's what you pass in the HTTP headers and that takes care of the authentication. You don't actually have to worry about that. That's because we went to all the work to put it into auth middleware. We went to all the work to put in the pieces into OpenStack Common to make that just very simple. You don't have to mess with it, it's just there. So at a high level architecture, Keystone matches almost every other OpenStack project really. Um, I guess the biggest thing that's different between our project and many of the others is that we don't sit on that uh, RPC bus that everybody else does that you know sort of came out of that core that was Nova. Um, we're strictly an, an HTTP based mechanism. There's no reason we couldn't sit on the RPC bus, it just hasn't been a real burning need to be able to do so. Um, there might be in the future. You know, we've, there's been some talk about, hey, how can we do authenticated RPC mechanisms, and you know what, what the what the implications for that might be. Kind of interesting, um, but it's just a standard WSGI application configured with paste. Um, you know, URI routes mapped to configurable backends. And when Keystone was originally prototyped, it was kind of a monolithic thing. And then we, we basically we rewrote the whole kit, keeping the API compatibility, and we moved it to a much more pluggable interface, much like all the other components that you see in OpenStack today. Cinder and, and uh, Quantum explicitly, where you can put in a pluggable backend that does the thing that you want it to do. Um, so we have a number of backends that you can have for identity, for catalog, for whatever else. Some of them are very simple SQL backends, you could have a key value backend, or you could plug it into some read-only service that you might already have that does authentication for your organization so that you don't have to re-implement that whole thing. Um. Yeah, I sort of already covered this, didn't I? It's, it's basically, Keystone is an operational facade to existing systems, much like Cinder is to whatever your existing volume systems is, uh, and uh, Quantum is for the existing no network systems. The supported backends today uh, include SQL, LDAP, Active Directory, put a big asterisk next to that, and a big thank you to the guys at CERN, by the way. Um, PAM, uh, and then a simple key value store. Um, catalog, same thing, there's a template mechanism or a SQL-based backend, tokens, you could throw it in a memcache, have a random key value store or use SQL, so forth and so on like that. Uh, the thing about the Active Directory, there's been some recent pieces added by uh, Jose. Fantastic work, dude. Um, thank you. Uh, it does mean that you have to configure your Active Directory in some specific ways to represent information that Keystone's going to expect to be able to get out, in particular the projects and the users and roles and know how they match up to your Active Directory schema. If you can't modify your schema, there's probably some other work we need to do to really make that happen, but it's a wonderful first step. And it built off Adam's original LDAP support, now we've got Active Directory support, and we're gonna continue to move it forward and make it more obvious. So Keystone history, in a nutshell. Um, I sort of talked about this at the very beginning, back when uh, you know, it was all coming together, the Glance and, uh, and Nova and Swift, it was, hey, we need to have uh, you know, a common accounts. We don't wanna have to have everybody create an account in every darn system that we have especially as OpenStack was pulling together and wanting to grow. So it really highlighted it up. Um, and by the time Cactus rolled around, it was under really active prototyping and a lot of good discussions, a lot of things going back and forth, experiments going out there, trying things around, um, and really kind of nailing things down. And then Diablo uh, is when it was really, was really kind of fleshed out to its, its full form uh, for what is the V2 API today. Um, that's not to say it was perfect, you know, there's a lot of lessons to be learned there, uh, but it really nailed it down. Uh, the downside was it was kind of changing up to the last minute there in Diablo, which made life a little bit difficult, um, and it's really changed how we've chosen to work on Keystone now in the future, so we take it a little bit more slow, we make sure it's really solid, uh, and most important, we try not to impact all the rest of the projects, because we're at a foundation level uh, that they're all relying on for authentication, we don't want to, you know, make a change and then suddenly break stuff. Um, so it has also had uh, an administrative API, and that's where you would do things like changing passwords and so forth. There wasn't much in the way of capability for a user to change their own password, um, and that's the, still the API that we're with, actually. Um, that prototype was great, it really got us out the door, it got us solid, and it got us moving forward. 
Um, and then right uh, a little bit after the Diablo release is, is kind of when I came in and, and worked with some other folks to um, step up and, and move Keystone forward past that. Um, and so that became the work that went into Essex. And that's the time when we went through and we basically gutted the code base, we replaced it, and we kept all the API functionality exactly the same. We didn't want to change both things at once. Let's not you know, do big forklifts. I don't know if any of you saw Dan Wentlet's talk, but the big thing is no forklifts. I mean, we need to keep this project solid, and I mean OpenStack solid and stable and be able to move it forward in well-considered increments and be able to move it you know, as we need to, still be able to deprecate things, but do it in a very intentional pattern. Um, that was also the time for the architectural shift to more independent drivers so that we could start backending it into read-only systems as opposed to having just a SQL-based system. Um, pieces had been added in. Uh, that's when we had in the original domains API, uh, and it was really a tough choice at the time. You know, do we try to push this all in and do this all at once, or do we take it piece by piece, and we chose to do it piece by piece. So we maintained that 100% API compatibility as we went out the Essex release and really you know, fixed up the stuff, uh, if you will, to allow us to move forward in the future. And then that's exactly what we did in Folsom. So in Folsom, the big addition really was this PKI-based uh, mechanism for the tokens. That's not enabled by default, but hopefully by the end of Grizzly, that's exactly what we will be using for defaults. Uh, and then we'll be able to build on that, whatever, by the time Grizzly goes out the door. Okay, so we'll look at it sure quicker. I said by the end of, I got us lots of time to review it. Um, right, totally derailed me. Good heckler. Uh, kept everything rock solid. Again, we maintained that 100% API compatibility. Um, and then uh, kind of notable, we, you know, we really kind of focused on making sure that when we understood security issues as they came up, we dealt with them as quickly as possible, as efficiently as possible. We backported them, we loaded them out. We worked with the OpenStack security team, which was uh, a bit of a learning experience for me because I really hadn't done that before, but it worked out really well. Uh, and I think we got six or seven total security fixes out. Some of them were, you know, last minute, oh my God, ah, oh, hair and fire things. And some of them were like, yeah, you know, we really know this is not the best way of doing it. Let's fix it up. Um, and then, you know, sort of at the end of the, the Folsom release, uh, Russell was going through the list. He's like, hey, you know, we really ought to kind of call that a CVE because that was actually a security fix. I was like, oh yeah, right, okay. So then we released a whole bunch of announcements that we fixed it, even though we fixed it months before. Um, so we're learning how to make that all work properly. But that's probably pretty much what we did in Folsom. It really set the stage to move it forward um, and make things go, go even further in Grizzly. Now, what's gonna happen in, in Grizzly, this is actually sort of a difficult thing to say because um, our sessions aren't until Thursday. So we haven't actually talked about everything that we're going to do and nailed down all these plans, but these are kind of the highlights uh, from talking with uh, some of the core in, in Keystone and the, the things that I've been hearing from other people in other talks during the, the first part of the session. Um, and that is, uh, we're gonna take the V3 API, which is actually up there in an implemented state right now in a feature branch. We're gonna land it in master and we're gonna start rolling it out. We'll be rolling V3 out with V2, running them in parallel for some time and then moving that forward. Um, so this means off changes that will impact every project, which means going to every project and making sure it works smoothly, fixing the bugs, figuring out what you know could be done wrong, could be done better. Um, although we nail down the V3 API spec in terms of, okay, this is what we're going to do, as in we have it now in, uh, uh, in source control and we're doing it with revisions to update that spec, um, we're still leaving it open to lessons learned. And really that was uh, some advice that I got from Brian and, and the Glance team that they had done a spec exactly that way, started implementing it, and then realized, oh shit, we really screwed this up. Um, and then had to go back and, and retrace some steps and redo some things. So we hope there's not gonna be significant changes, but you know, we'll start with where we are. We've got initial implementation out there. We've got tests wrapped around it. We're going for full coverage, really move this forward slowly, intentionally, carefully, um, and then get it out there. The idea being have the V3 API out and running as a default, ideally, by Grizzly. Um, and then an H and I, somewhere in that time frame deprecate out the V2, um, so that we'll switch all the way over to the V3 API somewhere in the next couple releases down the road. So not fast, not all at once, no forklift, a very intentional, thoughtful step forward. The other thing that we're really gonna be focusing on, well, one of the other things that we're really gonna focus on, um, is consolidating the policy files. Um, really heard this loud and clear, actually, during the end of the Folsom release. It was like, well, you know, what do I do about this? We had a lot of capabilities for RBAC that were already in the system, and it just wasn't clear how to do it from a deployment perspective. Uh, and I promised Anne, and she's been so nice to me and hasn't told me that I broke all of my promises to her, but I did. 
um, in that I didn't get the documentation consolidated for, here's some examples of how to do that. Um, we just ran out of manpower in the Keystone project, actually, is what it amounted to. Um, in terms of being able to consolidate this together, get it out there, and put some more examples in place. And really, that's also prep work for being able to consolidate all the policy files in Keystone as a single source of truth. So that's going to be something we'll be focusing on, just pulling it together. Matter of fact, we're having a session on that on Thursday. Uh, I think it's at 2. Is that when we decided to do it? Yeah. 3.20. I changed it in, I figured out how to change it in sketch, so I did. So it says policy now. Um, so if you're uh, implementing Keystone and you know, have thoughts about what you want to see in terms of specific RBAC capabilities and segregation and example policy, you know, basically configurations across an entire OpenStack deployment, please come and give us your feedback at that time because I really want to try to collect this together. Uh, I'm mostly in the just collect and document phase so we can put them together as recommended deployments and you know, ways to be able to do this. Um, other things that have been on the list for Grizzly is extending the authorization mechanism. It's been a need for quite some time to have something that would allow us to do uh, delegation or impersonation, something equivalent to that, so that you can say, hey, um, on behalf of me, I want the system to go ahead and take that block volume snapshot and throw it up in Swift, right? So to do that, Glance is gonna be talking, or something, Cinder is gonna be talking to Swift, and how's it actually gonna do that? I mean, is it gonna take my credentials and pass them all around? What if it's time delayed and the token's expired? Uh, there's a lot of different pieces that are going on. So we have some proposals out, some discussions going on, um, and some of this is also up for discussion on Thursday. Um, we're gonna continue to extend down the Active Directory support, uh, hopefully get it to the point where you can use it on a totally stock Active Directory system. Um, and some of that also goes to, what if we wanna use different authentication systems beyond Active Directory? That's been the most common request. But there's also, hey, you know, I've already got Kerberos in my environment. Uh, maybe I'm a research university, something along those lines. I want to be able to plug into that. And that's been a fairly common request as well. So allowing us to plug into something that doesn't have all the authentication, doesn't have all the details we need for authorization, as in projects and roles, but would be able to make the authentication pluggable specifically outside of an identity system and come up with some more patterns for along those lines. Um, and that's where the externalizing authentication really comes into, just as a, a kind of a combination of that stuff with Active Directory. Um, obviously, moving the default token to PKI, review is up. Um, and then there's a bunch of work that we're doing around uh, the CLI and common authentication. There were some great discussions earlier related to uh, just common CLI tools and making it uh, very easy to use them so you didn't have to know Nova versus Glance versus Keystone to interact with OpenStack. Um, but more importantly also is being able to use Keystack from the other clients so that they didn't all have to redo the auth implementations, which all of them do right now. Um, but none of them are, are particularly satisfactory, so we're gonna reset that a little bit, get it set up in a clear Python API, make it available to the other APIs, move that forward. Um, and with luck, we'll have a couple other alternative APIs out there, maybe not in Keystone Core, maybe not anything core or whatever else, but there'll be you know p pieces out there that uh, are available in open contr contribution that you could use if you wanted to work from alternate languages, whether it be PHP or Ruby or Objective-C or whatever you like. The last thing is, uh, We've got uh, a talk on Thursday at the end of the day. Uh, David Chadwick has been talking about how to enable federation among multiple instances of Keystone. Um, I totally blackballed it for discussion last year, or last summit, because I just wanted to focus on, let's take one thing at a time. Uh, but it's, we've got it at the point where we're stable enough now that I think it's really worth talking about what are the use cases, what do we want to enable, how do we want to enable trust delegation, and how do we want to support that. Um, not for expected, honestly, implementation in Grizzly, but to set the stage for it, because I expect that we don't have some of the things we need to be able to get there. Maybe we do. Maybe it'll go much faster than I thought, but I'm learning that this doesn't always go as fast as I want it to. So do the learning, do the discussions, um, and then go from there. Um, and that is what I have. So with that, let me open the floor to questions. Um, we go from there. Mr. Henry. As much as possible, yes. Um, the ideal way to have anything, in my mind, that's, that's reasonably supported is to make sure it either goes into Tempest or it gets into DevStack in some form so that you could run a variation of DevStack that has it available so that we can test it and make sure it runs. I imagine there's gonna be some plugins that are just you know, by so-and-so. Um, you know, there have been some companies that have approached me over time saying, hey, I'm an identity provider and I wanna write a plugin for Keystone, and I'm like, sweet, go ahead and do that. Um, but it's gonna be up to them to really validate that it all functions and, and assert that it's you know a good plugin, if you will. Okay, so basically, we have to the, the master 
Yeah, whoever does it. You are totally channeling Gabriel, aren't you? Oh, God. No idea. Ironically, I took right. Ironically, I heckled uh, uh, poor Dan just before this, saying, "Well, how are you doing? How are you exposing these capability things to Horizon?" Um, they're using the extensions mechanism. We'll clearly, you know, need to support that. But I think maybe there's something more we need to do across all of OpenStack, especially with more and more of us being plugins, with those plugins having custom capabilities that some might have and some others might not, or optional implementations, if you will, um, to really expose that up in some fashion to, keep to Horizon. Yeah, and Horizon is the with the, um, the right now. Um, Other questions? Yes? I, so I was wondering for your optimization tokens, uh, uh, I'm uh, in the process of building an application which is likely to use lots of tokens in lots of places, shuttle them around, so I want them to be very efficient to process. So I'm thinking something like OpenID, which is you know HMAC based JSON objects rather than RSA operations or XML and canonicalized XML and that kind of stuff. Uh, is there any desire, plan, thought to support that kind of a token? We are very intentionally supporting a common Python API for the OpenStack projects so that they don't have to mess with doing exactly what you're doing. Um, whether the underlying implementation becomes something else in the future, um, right now, no. I mean, right now we're gonna move to the PKI stuff and then use that to leverage. Um, but where we go in the future, there's nothing that says we couldn't um, switch out the entire authentication layer to use OpenID or straight up Kerberos, should we be insane enough to want to drive those libraries? Um, you know, something along those lines. It's, it's capable of doing that, but it's not in our immediate plans at this time. Uh, what, what yeah. You must be David. Yeah, David. Brilliant. <laughs> Very nice to meet you. I've been wanting to meet you. Um, is, is that you actually would define an API as a token issuing service and the token validation service. And then you would just plug in yes. your own token issuer. You can have a token in any format. You just, the keystone just calls get me the token. You get the token, pass it out to the client, the client will pass it back, and it's using the cost of token validation. Right. And if you do it that way, then you, you can actually say you can have any, any sort of uh, Right. And that's totally what's on the table for discussion on Thursday afternoon. So if you're interested, please attend. Yes, I am. And in fact, that's kind of the proposal yeah. I had in mind. I will right. find you okay. after this talk. Thank you. Looks like you're getting support already. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. There, there is an intention to do something with the state of the token to at least expose a little bit more. Right now it's very simple, it's either valid or not. Um, and it would be nice to be able to support an intermediate state even if it's not necessarily defined on how that is. And that would be necessary to support something like a multi-factor authentication, um, you know, whatever you wanted to do. And there's been a lot of talk and thought about it, but no, uh, nobody stood up and said, yeah, I'm gonna go do that work right yet. Um, if you're interested, it's totally there, the blueprints are up. Um, you know, the support is, is desired. It's simply uh, basically lacking resources to make it implemented right now. I think we've pulled in quite a bit into uh, some, again, federation models, some of the general purpose mechanisms for providing um, a related service, essentially, for an identity provider. Mm -hmm. What would you guys do? What are you going to put in the view on the multi factor web? 
Lots of talks on Thursday. Still gives you a new token. Yes, that is still the case. Reuse intentional reuse of token. Um, I don't think anybody's been opposed to it. Just so much as nobody stepped up and said, "That really pisses me off. I'm going to go do it." Did we? That, and that's exactly where we're planning on addressing that. Because it, it asks for basically a new token every time you even kind of look at it. Sometimes it asks for three or four every time you look at it. It's just sort of strange. So it's like, oh, let's get that fixed, shall we? Other questions? Yeah. In that delegation discussion, um, is there any thought about uh, constrained delegation to other users? How do I learn more about it or contribute? Thursday. Anything else? All right, obviously Thursday, Keystone Day upstairs. Please, um, if you're interested, if you want to help contribute, um, if it's just something you want to find out what's going on and what the actual you know, conversations are and how we're doing the design, join us. Uh, it's open for all. Thank you very much.